Hello everybody, good afternoon, or, or better, uh, bonjour. Je suis enchanté pour uh, être ici. Oui? Oui? Ah. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Uh, and that's, well, my poor French, that was all that I had, okay? And just in case you're wondering, I'm a Brazilian Japanese. Yes, I flew straight from Brazil to here, so that's why I'm very happy to be here for the first time in Luxembourg. And my name is Edson Yanaga. I guess you can see that on the screen. I'm a director of developer experience at Red Hat. My Twitter handle is at Yanaga. Just in case you want to follow me, I talk a lot about DevOps, microservices, domain-driven design, Java, and other kind of stuff. And today, I'm going to be talking about migrating to microservice databases. How do, can you take your old legacy relational database monolith and then split that to microservices databases? I, uh, I'm also a Java champion and a Microsoft MVP, and I work for Red Hat. How cool is that? You know, it's a kind of weird com combination, but I think that in the end it just means that open source has won when even the largest proprietary software company in the world has, uh, has uh, an underlook in the open source development. I think we've been doing something right in the open source development community in the past like 10 to 15 years. And I also like to give you a tip. Uh, I just re recently released a book from O'Reilly, which has the same title of, the, of this talk, Migrating to Microsoft Databases. And if you check into this URL, developers.redhat.com, promotions, migrate to Microsoft Databases, you'll be able to get a free copy of the uh, uh, ebook. Uh, I also have some uh, hard copies here, just in case you have some questions at the end. I have four hard copies of the book. And if you, you don't have to type the full URL to get the book, uh, just in case you type developers.redhat.com slash books, you'll be able to get a list of the books, and uh, my book is one of them that is available for download, okay? And I also, uh, I always like to start my talks with this quote from Forbes, now every company is a software company. I like to say that you don't, you don't work for a bank, you work for a software company. You don't work for an industry, you work for a software company. Because we're living in this new world where software changes everything. Some people call this digital transformation or digital economy. And I'm used to be one of these people that thought that economics had everything to do about money. But after studying a bit, and particularly reading some um, behavioral economics b uh, books, I realized that economics has nothing to do about money, but has everything to do about people, because they basically we study how people interact with each other and how they can change a system from one state to the other, and they might have some motivations for that. Some good motivations for people usually are uh, love, hate, power, and also money. So when we're talking about digital economy, we're basically talking about how people interact with each other, and how software can change the way that people interact with each other. Some great examples of this new digital economy is that the largest car transportation company in the world owns no cars, which is Uber. The largest lodging company in the world owns no real estate, which is Airbnb. The largest online retailer in the world owns no stock, which is Alibaba. And the largest content network in the world produces no content, which is Facebook. All of these companies, they have something in common, is that they only exist because of software. So software is changing the world, and I truly believe uh, that software can change people's lives for the better. Uh, I, uh, I'm, uh, I consider myself to a software craftsman, and the best definition that I have of a software craftsman is somebody who care about, that he or she cares about what he, he or she does. So we know that software can influence people's lives for the better, and that's why we can make a choice. We can make people's uh, lives miserable with what we do, or we can make them awesome. I think that we, if you're all here today at Vox Luxembourg trying to uncover better ways to deliver software into production, then we all care and we can do make uh, the world that we live better for us, for the, the, our children, grandchildren, for the people that we love and for the people that we don't know yet. So that's, that's a very nice thing to be doing. And with all of the discussions between DevOps and microservices, of course, that's a long topic, but if I had to choose just one thing to tell you about all of this discussion, I would say that the most important thing about any discussion in DevOps and microservices is the feedback loop. The feedback loop is a very important thing for us humans because it allows us to ask us if we're improving what we're doing every day, if we're doing the right thing right. So if you think about all of the major 
evolutions or revolutions that we had in the software development world in the past 20 to 10, 25 or 30 years. All of them tried to improve the feedback loop a bit. Uh, we used to have to code our programs using just like text editors. We need to compile them. It took some like minutes or even hours to, for us to know if the syntax was, was correct. Then we created like uh, now these days we have like IDEs which, that while we're typing can automatically check the syntax of our programs. Then we took a long time to test if our programs were correct. Then we created automated testing. It also took a long time for us to check if our code that was uh, integrated very well with the code that other programmers uh, were developing. Then we created continuous integration. Then we created continuous delivery. Then we created continuous deployments. And now we're talking about microservices. So what is the important thing that we should take from all of these evolutions? And if I had to give you just one technical term, for me, the most important measure of improvement in any DevOps and microservices process is the bad size. And technically speaking, bad size is the amount of changes that you deliver into production between each one of your releases. And let's try to make a very simple co correlation. I used to be an independent consultant before joining Red Hat, and I visit many different companies ranging from startups to many to like big financial industries. And I always ask us, why can't you deploy software into production faster? And the number one excuse that everybody always gave me was that we can't deploy faster into production because when we release software into production, we have too many bugs. And these bugs, of course, this causes a lot of problems into productions. So we need more time for testing. But people don't realize uh, is that when you have like one month to create a new release of software, and you ask for more time for testing, they also give you more time to code. So if you're delivering, and the more code that you, uh, that you get into each one of your releases, the more bugs that you have. So I like to make a very simple or simplistic correlation saying that what causes bugs into productions, usually uh, the cause of bugs into productions are changes. And we have changes in three different areas when we're talking about software. We can have changes in the code. We can have changes in the environment the code is running. And we can have changes in the data. So let's try to simplify that even more. I'll say to you that what causes bugs into production are changes in code. So the more amount of changes that you have into one release, the more bugs you will have into production. And traditionally, we're trying to solve the, this problem by trying to have uh, more time between each one of the releases. But you see, that's the anti-economical way of trying to solve this problem, because the more changes I have, the more bugs into production. So the economical way of solve, trying to solve bugs into production should be trying to release smaller changes into production into each one of our releases. This way, the lesser the changes we have, the lesser the bugs we have into production, okay? That's the measure. So the smaller the batch size, the better the quality of the software that deliver into production. And even if we deliver uh, a bug into production, we just, just, we just change it like now, like into, into the ideal size of one commit. I just committed 50 lines of code and now I have a bug into production. Whereas the cause of the problem is very likely that the cause of the problem is that 50 lines that we just committed. So the smaller the batch size, the better the quality of the software that runs into production, and also the better is our feedback loop, our software development lifecycle, and everything else. And just to give you more technical terms, batch size is the amount of changes into, one, each, into each one of our releases. If you reduce the batch size, you're also reducing, reducing what we call the lead time, which is the amount of time that you take from idea to production. And you're also reducing your release cycle, which is the amount of time that you take between each one of your releases. So they are, they are all, uh, one of the measures impact the other. That's why if you had to choose one of the measures for you to improve, you should choose the bad size. Because for me, that's the most important measure in any DevOps and microservices um, process. But even if you try to reduce your batch size like to the ideal size of one commit, one deployment, there's something called a maintenance window, which is that specific time frame of the week, of the month, or the semester that you're able to deploy software into production because you're not allowed to disrupt your users into production. That's why the ops people, they don't allow you to make database changes or to release a new software into production in like 10 a.m. You know, on a Monday. Uh, you're not allowed to, disru to disrupt your users into production. That's why, well, even if you want to reduce your batch size sir, you still have the maintenance window, the ops guys will only allow you, you only allow, allow it to deploy your software like every Saturday 3 a.m. and you don't want to be the person deploying software on Saturdays 3 a.m. 
Yeah, you want to change that. And if you want to break this maintenance window, you need what? You need what we call zero downtime. And how do we do we use zero downtime deployments? The single requirement that we have to be able to create zero downtime deployments is that we need what we call a blue-green deployment architecture. And I want to try to explain that uh, very quickly for you. Uh, traditionally, in uh, your architecture, you have clients issuing requests directly to your deployment, which we'll call blue deployment. If you want a blue-green deployment architecture, you need to add another component to your architecture, which is the proxy, which could be a reverse proxy or a load balancer, doesn't matter. I'm just saying that you have another component that's receiving requests on behalf of, the, of your deployments, back, of your backend deployments, and forwarding them uh, uh, to the servers. Then if you want a blue-green deployment, you, you need to create two equal environments. Each one of them is capable of handing 100% of your production requests into any given moment. So you have, now you have two equal environments, and you have a proxy that is routing the request to your blue deployment or your green deployment. So if I want to update a new, a new version of my software into production, what do I do? I get, I stop the green servers, I copy the new artifacts. If I'm using Java, I start the servers, I wait for them to warm up, maybe I issue some fake requests just to warm up the server. When everything's okay, when everything is responding quickly enough, I can then just choose to route the, the production request back to the green deployment, and I can do that, the, the same thing with the blue deployment now. So now I have the, everything, uh, my green deployment's handling 100% of my requests, and if anything goes wrong, I still have the older version running on the blue deployment, okay? So blue-green deployments not only allow you to do zero downtime deployments, but it also allows you to have a safer deployment because you can always roll back to your previous version, which is already, which is still running on the blue deployment. But if everything goes okay, then maybe I can do the same things that I did with the green deployment, with the blue deployment. I stop the servers, copy the artifacts, start the servers, uh, wait for them to the warm up, and when everything's okay, I just get the router to issue the request back to the blue deployment too. And now if I want to, maybe I can have a load balancer. Okay, but that's not a requirement. We just need to have two equal separate environments so we can update one of them and if anything goes wrong, we can roll back to the other one or uh, if everything goes well, we can have another step and update the blue, the, the green deploy, the blue deployment too. But it doesn't matter how hard your code is or how hard it is to achieve blue-green deployments. I'm saying that with, when you want to update code, it's fairly easy because code, you just get a new version into production. When you have state, it's much harder. So code can be easy, but state is much harder. And when I'm saying state into software applications, usually we have two different kinds of state. We have ephemeral state, which is usually, again, the state that we store in HTTP sessions. Uh, the worst case, when you, if you lose your ephemeral state, the user will have to log back in again. If he or she was filling a form, uh, he or she will have to fill the form again. He or she might not be happy, but that's just all the state that you lost. If we're talking about persistent states, much harder. And for like enterprise software companies, usually the persistent state of your applications is stored into a relational databases. And how, do I, how can I achieve zero downtime deployments using relational databases? And that's usually the question number one that I receive when I'm talking about microservices. Okay, I get this idea, we need zero downtimes, we need to split the domain model, we need to split that into microservices, but what do I do with the data that is stored in my old legacy monolithic relational database with a lot of tables and columns? How do I deal with that? And the solution for that is that if you want to achieve zero downtime, even using a relational database or any other kind of persistent database, first, you need to automate everything. You're not allowed uh, anymore to, to execute your, your author table statements or your, or your update statement using your CLI or email on the SQL script to the DBA or creating a Jira issue to update the database schema. You need to al automate everything. And two of the most popular database, automation, uh, database migration automation tools are Flyway and Liquibase. As of this year, both are future complete. Uh, I don't have a, uh, one uh, um, I don't have a, a recommendation for you because both perform very well. I just have a particular taste for Flyway just because that's the tool that I've been using in, in the past few years and it performs very well. 
Both um, database migration tools, they can be tied to your deployment phase, so uh, or in, to your startup phase. So if you, when you start up your new application, it will automatically check the state of your database, and if anything changes, it, it, it will apply all the statements that you need to change the, the version of your database schema. Or else, my recommended approach in this case is that you to tie your database migration to, to your deployment pipeline. So you have one step in your deployment pipeline before releasing the new version of the software that will update your database schema before running your new version into production, okay? Uh, if you do that, then you have the, the requirement for being able to create zero downtime migrations. But how do I do that? How do I create zero downtime migrations? The simplest answer is I need to create migrations which are back and forward compatible, which means that each one of the database schema versions that are run into my uh, database, they must be compatible with the current version of my code and with the previous version of my code. That's how we do that and how it's possible to achieve that. And just to give you like a te technical term, I'm, say, I'm talking about migrations. Technically, migrations are, are the amount of um, alter table statements or, uh, or create table or update statements or delete statement, any kind of SQL statements that you must issue against your database to change the schema from one version to the other, okay? So migrations is this, this amount of uh, statements. And if you want to achieve zero downtime migrations which are back and forward compatible, First, we need to create them as baby steps, which means the smallest possible batch size. We also need to avoid too many rows into an update statement, for example, because too many rows in an update statement, if I have like a billion rows in a table and I issue an update statement, I'm gonna have a long lock time, and lock time means downtime to my application. I'm not allowed to do that. And the answer is that now we need to shard our updates. And sharding is a very fancy word for meaning that we just need to split the updates that we do into our database. So if we have like a billion rows, maybe we should be doing that a million rows at a time. So for example, if we used to do like auto table, rename something, then maybe we might need to, instead of just issuing a single SQL statement, we need to break down into baby steps. So now maybe I'll have to issue multiple statements instead of just one. Maybe I'll need to add a column, then update the values, and shard them, have, uh, have to issue multiple update statements, and then in the end, maybe I need to delete the column. Okay, so I've talked to many different teams and people worldwide about how we, they were solving the problem of applying zero downtime migration to productions, and I was able to collect and gather a pattern. So that's why um, I'll just uh, explain that to you very quickly. If you want to, 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 to see that in detail, you can read my books where I detail all of these uh, steps for the, uh, zero downtime migrations. But basically, we can have four different scenarios for applying zero downtime migrations, which are add a column, rename a column, change the type and format of a column, and delete a column. Okay. So add a column, uh, we have one, two, three, and four. Each one of these numbers can be a different release of your version into production. So in the first version, you're gonna uh, alter table add column. On the second version, you're gonna, your code is gonna compute the read value and write to the new column. When I say it's going to compute, maybe it's, that's a default value, or maybe it's, uh, you can calculate the column value by reading from the other columns of, of your system. Uh, third step, you're going to update the data using shards, which means you have to, uh, to break your updates uh, into multiple statements if that's too slow. And fourth step, your code will read and write from the new column, okay? And between each one of these steps, one, two, three, and four, you're going to open your database CLI and you're going to issue multiple select statements just to check if your application is behaving correctly, if it is reading and writing the right information from the right columns, right? And if you do that, this kind of migration, okay, it might sound a lot, a lot, like a lot of work, but in, you need to rehearse that. But, but all of the teams that I talk about when they decide to apply zero downtime migrations, they do that not only because of the zero downtime, because they allow it to do multiple version release into production every day. Uh, they do that uh, especially because it's very safe 
for me to be, de be to be deploying a new version of my database schema to production because each one of these steps is non-destructive. If I uh, get something wrong, I can always roll back to the previous version of my code and the application will still work. So the secret here is my database migrations, they are all non-destructive. I never lose any data. I don't need to rely on a backup to be recovering the data that I had before uh, I did my mistake. So add column is the simplest possible one. I also have the next one, rename a column. The steps are basically I add a column. My code reads from the old column and writes to both. Uh, third step, I copy the data using small shards, so I might have to replicate this third step multiple times. My fourth step, my code reads from the new column and writes to both. Fifth step, my code reads and writes from the new column. And sixth step, much later, I delete the column, okay? Why, do, why don't you delete the column in the, in the exact next step? Because deleting a column is a destructive statement. If you do that, the only way for you to recover the information is to restore a backup. So you never delete the column immediately after. You just mark the column for deletion. You just mark the column, create a, G, a Jira issue to your DBA, and in the next maintenance window, which could happen in the next month or in the next semester, then the DBA will check, well, this column isn't being used anymore in the, in the, in the past like three weeks or three months, it's safe for me now to delete because nobody's using that information anymore. So that's how you do zero downtime migrations for renaming a column. And the next uh, scenario is change the type and format of a column. And if you see a pattern here, that's all the same. If you want to change the type and format of a column, or if you want to change, uh, or if you want to rename a column, that's the same steps, and it's a good thing because you're always rehearsing the same step to to be able to achieve a zero downtime migration. And the last scenario is deleting a column, which basically means don't. You never delete a column in your database schema into production because that's a destructive statement. You just stop using the read value, but keep writing to the column. Why? Because your previous version might need still the value. Uh, that uh, was supposed to be written in the column. Uh, and if that's successful, then maybe uh, some versions later you can stop writing to the column and then mark the column for deletion, but you just do that much later uh, after the, you are sure that nobody's using that read value anymore. Okay, and you might be thinking that's just for columns, what about tables? If you think that a table is a set of columns, uh, any kind of these migrations, you can apply them multiple times to achieve the same effects for tables. What about my referential integrity constraints? Uh, if you think about this, this kind of constraints, you don't need these constraints for application to work. You don't need them for application to behave correctly. There is just a safety net. And I know I'm suggesting for you to drop the constraints exactly when things are more likely to go wrong, when I'm changing the things. But sometimes you, you need to break some walls to make room for, for improvement. So there's no choice. You just drop all of the, these constraints and recreate when all of your migrations are, are done. And the same, um, the same tip applies if you want to, uh, uh, to add not no constraints to your database. Uh, you can't add them at the first moment. You just wait for all of your migrations to be applied. Then you can apply your not no constraints, okay? So that's the basic steps of, for you to be able to apply zero downtime migrations to your applications. And why did I explain all of that for you? Because when you, you had just a single monolith, uh, your application was equal, the, your system availability used to be tied to your monolith of availability. But now when we have microservices, when we have multiple different artifacts running run into our system, we don't have just a single point of failure. Now we have multiple points of failure, and we're not allowed at that level. Well, I need to I need have downtime from this microservice and another one, another one. Your downtime is simply multiplied by the amount of artifacts that you have in production. So you're not allowed to have downtime because, well, I'm updating the database schema of this microservice or this other microservice or this monolith. You need zero downtime deployments to, to improve the general availability of your entire system, right? Now we'll dig into the microservice characteristics uh, properly. Uh, and I would like to uh, excuse myself if I'm speaking too fast because I have a lot of content to cover on the session. Uh, I hope you can forgive me. And you can always check the information later more calmly if you read the book. Martin Fowler did a great, a great job trying to collect some of the microservice characteristics from this, this kind of distributed systems. And we have particularly like nine different characteristics. Today, I'm going to be talking just about the, what I consider the most polemic one, which is the decentralized data management characteristics, which states that 
each one of my microservices must have its own database. Each microservice must own the data which is manipulating. So the question is, if I, the best practice for me is to start from a monolith where, where I have an old legacy uh, monolithic relational database with lots of tables and columns, how do I choose which tables should I split and put that on a separate microservice? That's question number one. And I'll have to tell you that the answer uh, uh, gets through like proper domain modeling. I believe the proper uh, domain-driven design techniques for you to create like your con concise and low coupled and high cohesive uh, bounded context is the answer, but it really depends on your business model. So I can't get, give you a, like a general tip for achieving that because you have to study very carefully your domain model and how it behaves. But if you decide to, sp if you choose uh, which tables to, to split into your microservice database, I can help you on how can you integrate the data later. So first step, extracting your microservice database. If I have this, this huge monolith, this, and I need one database per microservice, the answer is that with your monolith for some time, both your microservice and your monolith will have to read and write from the same set of tables or maybe from the same database schema, uh, at least on the first moment. Uh, okay, and it's a very complicated step. But it's, it's, if splitting is not easy, how do I integrate that later? You see, splitting the, the database is a matter of domain modeling problem. How do you integrate that? That's a technology and architecture problem, and that's what I want to share with you today. But before I dig into the nine different strategies for integrating microservice database that I have to show you, I'll have to start a, a, a small discussion about consistency models. And I'm going to give you an oversimplified version of these models. For anybody that has ever distribu studied distributed systems, might uh, sound like a scene, but I'll try to oversimplify them just for the didactic purpose. Basically, the consistency models that are important for us in this case are strong consistency and eventual consistency. And if I had to explain for you that, in a strong consistent model, if you have multiple nodes in your system, and I say that, well, in this node I'm going to update information, I now equals to five, all of the other nodes in the system must agree on the new value before any client can read this new value, okay? So before everybody agrees, well, now I equals to five, nobody can read the value of i, okay? This is a strong consistency model, and it's usually the model that you can achieve user transactions or distributed transactions, okay? Everybody needs to agree on the new value. Eventual consistency, and I'm gonna be discussing a special case of eventual consistency, which is strong eventual consistency, which means that there are no conflicts in information, because in a traditional eventual, uh, eventual consistent system, you can have multiple nodes and you are allowed to write on any of the nodes. In a microservice architecture, particularly in enterprise system, usually you will choose one of the nodes of your system to be the canonical source of information, which means that if I'm extracting the customer tables and columns from the, my monolith into a microservice, the only point in my system that is allowed to change the customer information is now the customer microservice, right? So I have one single point of the system that is allowed to perform changes and into an eventual consistent system. If I update here, now i equals to five, all of the other nodes can still have outdated values, but they all write correct values, okay? So now, now let's suppose i was free, and now I update i equals to five, so uh, other clients can read i equals to five before the, the information gets propagated and updated to the rest of the system, okay? So in a strong eventual consistent system, you can have outdated information, but the information is always valid. You don't have inconsistent information. And if you think about that, most of the systems that we code today, they are already eventual consistent. We're just not used to thinking about that. Because if you get, uh, if I have an application, a web application that queries a database, extract information, manipulates that, and show me that information on the screen, by the time I see the information on the screen, it's already outdated, okay? It's already eventual, strong, uh, uh, it already has a strong eventual consistency. We're just not used to thinking about that. But if you have a distributed system, most of the times we want a stronger eventual consistent system uh, because of performance. We're not allowed to just use a strong consistency in a large scale distributed system. 
Another topic that I have to touch is uh, CRUD and SecureIS. And maybe most of you have ever used it uh, or is using uh, CRUD architectures uh, because it's the simplest possible one. In fact, for like 90% of the scenarios, maybe CRUD is the best architecture for you to be using. Uh, if you have CRUD, you have all of the operations, create, read, update, and delete, which means the read and write operations are using the same data model, are using the same um, uh, domain model for all of these operations. Let's me, le, let give me give you an example. If I have a customer microservice and I have a customer class, uh, it, which means that I'll be using the customer class and the customer table for all of the operations, for read and write operations. This is CRUD. Things start to get blurry when we're talking about secure S because many different people have different notions of what is a secure S architecture. And again, I'll try to explain that in a very simple way. Secure S stands for as command query responsibility segregation. And it's a very fancy name for a very simple pattern that most of us have used in the past. We just didn't know that it had this name. In a secure S architecture, may I, have, I can have different models for read and write operations, which means that if I'm going to create a customer, maybe I'm using the customer class, I create an instance of that, and I ask my, like my ORM to persist my customer instance. Okay, That's a write operation. But if I want to read the information from my database, maybe, well, customer has a lot of things, has phone numbers, has address, maybe it has cr credit history, maybe it has uh, past addresses, uh, maybe it has uh, like transaction history. It can, it can have a lot of things. I'm not supposed to be, like, to be retrieving all of the customer information for a customer report. When the customer report only needs the customer name, ID, and its email address. I, I'm not supposed to retrieve all of the customer information just to be creating a customer report. So what do you do? You create a customer DTO, which is a plain old data transfer object, not in the sense of EJB 1.1, but I'm saying that a DTO because it has no behavior, that's an anemic object, just a simple POJO. So you create a customer DTO, and you only retrieve the ID, the name, and the email of the customer to be used to generate the customer reports. Since we're using different classes, different domain model classes, customer and customer DTO for read and write operations, we are creating a secure IS architecture, OK? I'm talking about that in domain models. Some people say that secure IS um, means that you have different APIs for reading and writing. That's basically the same thing because you have different APIs, you're usually always using a different domain model. Okay? Then, if you think about that, well, I'm reading, but I'm still reading and writing from the same set of tables in the database. You can improve your secure S architecture if you create secure S architectures with separate data stores. And just in case if you were wondering, if, did I ever do that? If you ever created a view to generate a report, and you query it against the view. If you ever created a materialized view and create a report against the materialized view, you created a secure S architecture with different separate data stores. How do you, why do you do that? Because of performance, right? You want to, to, to issue your queries against the view or materialized view because it's much faster than querying uh, the, all of the customer like uh, rows uh, every single time that you want like an aggregate report. That's why we do secure S with separate data stores. And this particular architecture is very, very important since we're talking about microservices and distributed systems because that's the main pattern that we're going to use to integrate information later, right? In every discussion about microservices, we need to talk, be talking about secure S and event sourcing. Some people mistake one for the other, uh, when in fact, uh, uh, event sourcing can be used alone, secure S can be used alone, but they, well, they, they are fit together. Uh, there are many use cases where it's very useful for you to be combining secure S and event sourcing. So let me give you an example of what is a secure, uh, an event sourcing architecture. The classic example is a bank account. So in a bank account, uh, I have a lot of transactions. You don't update the, the amount of money that you have in your bank account directly. You just create like transactions, debit and credit transactions, to be uh, manipulating the amount of money that you have in your bank account. And if you assume that all of the bank accounts start with a zero amount, if we add multiple uh, debit and credit statements, it doesn't matter. Into any given moment of time, you can just get the first transaction and apply all of them sequentially. 
Uh, in the end, you'll be able to check how much money do you have into each one of your accounts. That's even sourcing. The amount of money that you have in your bank account is not stored in a single column in your database. Uh, the amount of money that you have in your account is represented by a stream of transactions that you have stored in a separate table. This is event sourcing. The state of the data is a stream of events. But you might see, and if you want to check how much money do you have, you just start with zero and apply all of the transactions over and over until you have the final result. And you might be thinking, this should be very slow as the amount of transactions grow and as the amount of bank accounts in your system also grow. So event sourcing for some read operations can be, can be very expensive. That's why you usually combine event sourcing with SecureS. So what do you do? The writing operations are still written as transactions, but the read operations, you create a separate table with a separate column for just caching purposes. So every time you write a transaction, then you can update synchronously or asynchronously. Another table is stating that the current cached amount of money that you have in your bank account is this. But you do that only for performance reasons. And in fact, many banking systems, if not all, during every single night, they just take that, which was the last amount from the past day, the, uh, like 100 euros, and now you get all of the transactions that were applied in the last day, you sum all of that, and you check if the cached amount of money that you have in your bank account equals to the audited amount of money that you just computed. That's an auditing process that uh, all of the banks do every single night. And, and that's why SecureIS and event sourcing, they work very well. You want to, that's very useful to, to, to use an event sourcing uh, architecture because it allows you to have auditing. It allows you to have like a time machine. You can always roll back the transactions to check how much money you had in a given moment uh, and uh, everything else. Uh, it's also very performant. And a secure S, you create a secure S read data store just for performance reasons because you can check uh, instantaneously how much money do you have. And many people that discuss um, microservices, they try to sell you, well, event sourcing and secure S is the best thing for microservice architecture. You should be using event source because that's a silver bullet. Well, I've been able to design and help teams to use event source in many different cases. And what do I have to tell you? Most, if not all of the teams that I've worked, ever worked with, when they try to do event sourcing, they do it wrong. So you must be, be very experienced in how do you create your events, how do you propagate that, or, uh, or else you will have a very, very tightly coupled system. So you must be very careful. But the other way, as I have to say, that the only way for you to learn how to do proper event sourcing is to first create bad event sourcing architectures. So it's a kind of a, a trade-off. But the one thing that I definitely do not recommend is to you to, for you to take your old legacy monolithic code base, which is modeled as CRUD, and try to modify that to event sourcing because that's too much work. Maybe we have other strategies for you to be able to create like event sourcing properly, and we'll discuss them later. Okay. Given that this this contents context, I'll be able to share with you different, nine different scenarios that I was able to collect in the past uh, almost two years, uh, where I've been talking with many, many different teams worldwide. Uh, so some of them I recommend, some of them I do not recommend, but I didn't judge when I was talking to people. I was just discussing with them which were the solutions that were applied in their architectures and how they solved their problem and if it's working properly or not. So I discussed some problems of these architectures too. So we have basically nine different strategies, which are shared tables, database views, materialized views, triggers, transactional code, ETL, data virtualization, event sourcing, and data capture, change data capture. So I have a cool demo in the end, and I'll be able to share you some considerations about each one of these strategies. So the first strategy is shared tables, which means both your monolith and your microservice will be reading and write from the same tables. I even consider this a hack. But it's the fastest data integration. If you need something for tomorrow, then maybe you should be considering that. But you should be very careful because it's so tightly coupled, which means that if you, if you let this kind of integration strategy persist for a long time, it will just prevent you from changing everything. Uh, because I can't change my microservice because the monolith is reading and writing from the same tables. And I can't change my monolith because my microservice is reading and writing from the same tables. In fact, that's a perfect excuse that many people use. I can't change anything at all because other teams are using the same sets of tables and columns in my database. Okay? 
But on the other hand, you have strong consistency because everybody is issuing transactions against the same database, and you might have like low cohesion and very high coupling. I do not advise for you to be doing that, but if you do, just change it very quickly. It's almost a hack. But you can use a database view to be creating your secure S data store. And, uh, 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 and before that, let me explain why I'm discussing that you need a secure S data store. The typical pattern that I've seen when people start to use microservices is that I have a monolith. Uh, well, I decide to extract the customer information from my monolith to my microservice. So let's move the data to my microservice, then everything I need to do is I will create a DAO here. I'll change my DAO because my microservice now offers a REST endpoint, and my DAO now will issue HTTP requests against my microservice. That's the first step. When people deploy that into production, they realize that, oh my god, it doesn't scale. It's too slow. Well, what do you need? Well, it's not scaling, so maybe I need a cache. So now they create a cache, internal cache, in the monolith to, to cache the, the customer information that, in the, that is in the customer microservice. Then you realize the internal cache is not enough. We need an external cache to be storing our entities to be performant. Okay? Now it is performant, but then they realize Oh, we have a lot of different reports or other routines that they were using the customer table and the customer columns in my monolith. I used to do that all with a single join, select something from uh, this table and the customer table. Now, I, if I want to generate the same result, I need to do an uh, in-memory join because I'm talking about tables and columns, and now I'm talking about objects in uh, an external cache. Now I need to join all of this information in memory. Then people realize it's too much work why don't I create like a secure S data store? Why don't I create a replica of the customer information in the database so I can still keep using my old joins in my table? But this table, uh, this copy table is just updated synchronously or synchronously from my microservice to here, right? So that's the reason of why we create secure S data stores. Microser distributed systems, they don't scale. If every time I need information, I'm going to get that from the microservice. So I need a cached copy for performance reasons. Uh, I create a secure as that is stored, so I, keep, I can keep using my old code or new code, depending on the case. And how do I create the secure as that is stored? This is the discussion that I'm presenting for you right now. How, uh, which are the integration strategies that I'm capable of using to be creating this secure as data store uh, to consume the information that is being written in my canonical microservice. Okay? So I've discussed uh, shared tables. You can create this secure as data store using database views, which of course is, are the easiest one to implement, uh, has the largest support from the MMS vendors as of this year, even embedded database like SQLite and H2, they have uh, views. You might have some possible performance issues depending on which database you're using. Uh, you have strong consistency because you have all of the transactions on the same place. One database must be reachable by the other, which means if you want to create a secure S architecture on separate database servers, uh, if you're using Oracle, I know it's possible you need to create a, a DB link, and I know if I have any DBA here, it's going to curse me, but I've seen teams doing that, and in many use cases, it works, okay? And again, on Oracle at least, depending on how you create your view, it can be updatable, even though I don't recommend that. Materialized views, they offer better performance than views because instead of just being an alias to a query, uh, materialized view is a real table on the database, so you can, you, you can optimize that just as you would optimize a table. You can have strong or eventual consistency. If your materialized view is updated on every single commit, you, it, it is a strong consistent. If you update that on demand on a timer trigger, it's eventual consistent already. Okay. Again, one database can be, uh, must be reachable by the other, which means that, at least on Oracle, you need a DB link. I strongly suggest you for not being upda be, be, uh, updating too often if you're using a DB link. But if you have, like, um, if you don't have very strict time requirements for your outdated data, database materialized views using even a DB link can be a very, um, good and nice solution, okay? I've been, I've, I have did that myself a couple of times. I've, been, uh, I've seen teams doing that, and it simply works if you don't have strict um, uh, refresh requirements. Uh, again, it, must, it can be updatable, at least on Oracle, but again, I don't recommend you to do that. 
You can also use a database trigger to be updating your secure S data store. Again, depends on DBMS support. You always have a strong consistency because you're running on the same transaction. One database must be reachable by the other, but it only works if you have a point-to-point -point integration. Why is that? Because has a customer and a monolith. Every time I update a customer, my trigger updates the table here. It works for point-to-point -point integrations. When your distributed system starts to grow, you can have like 10 different microservices, and all of them, they require you uh, to update the customer information too. So you update the customer, you have to update 10 different tables in different databases using a single trigger. It doesn't scale, and it's very hard for you to maintain this kind of code. So it's feasible if that's just a point-to-point -point integration. If you're just starting your integration system, and uh, you need to choose, if you start, decide to grow your microservice architecture, you have to change this, this integration strategy to another more advanced ones. Transactional code, again, when I say transactional code, can be any code, can be store procedures or distributed transactions, and it's, uh, it's kind of the same case as the trigger. Uh, it has a strong consistency. You might have possible cohesion and coupling issues, performance issues. It can be updated because it's just code. You can do that whatever you want. But again, it's only feasible for point-to-point -point integrations, and it doesn't scale as the number um, of nodes increase in your system. For another way for you to create your CQRS data store is for you to use ETL tools. Uh, you have lots of available tools. You can use tools like ClickView, like Pentaho, like Dash Builder to be creating your secure S data store. It usually requires an external trigger, usually on demand on the bottom, or you create a, a cron trigger to be updating your, 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 your BI view. Uh, you can aggregate from multiple data sources. It's always event ecosystem because by the time you read, it's already outdated. It, that's a read only integration because ETL tools were not designed to be uh, two ways. And uh, I recommend this approach if your team already has an ETL expert, you're already using an ETL tool for other purposes, then maybe you can use the ETL tool. You already have the expertise. You don't want to use another tool into your, into your system just for this integration purposes. Then depending on the scale of your requirements, you might be able to use your own ETL tool to be creating these secure as data stores, right? Next one is data virtualization. This is my, one of my favorites. Data virtualization allows you to have real-time access because you're just creating a virtual database on top of your physical database. You always have a strong consistency. You can aggregate from multiple data sources, and it can be updated depending on the platform. This is a diagram working how, uh, showing how a data virtualization platform, TAID, works. Basically, I want you to, to, you to check that you can have multiple data sources, and you can create multiple virtual databases on top of your physical database. Why I like this approach so much? Because that's the safest one for you when you're trying to decide how, which piece of information you want to split from your monolith. Because one of the bad things of trying to split information is that if you do it wrong, you have a huge problem. Right? But if you're using a uh, data virtualization platform, you can just split information, create your microservice, uh, you can check how your application behaves, and you didn't need to change your monolith at all because the physical tables are still there. You're just creating a virtualized view for you to create your microservice architecture. If you did it right, then maybe later you can change your physical table. But if you did it wrong, you just discard the virtual database and start it over again. So it's very, very safe. Event sourcing. Again, I discussed it a bit before. The state of data is a stream of events. You have uh, easiest auditing. You have eventual consistency because usually the, the messages are propagated from, uh, from a message bus to be updated on the other endpoints. Uh, it's highly scalable because of the message bus. And it has the pros and cons that I've discussed before. And change data capture, some people call this like poor man's event sourcing, but I think that this is my favorite data integration strategy. If you have a legacy application with a legacy uh, relational database, you don't want to mess with the old code. It doesn't matter which technology are you using because a CDC2, a change data capture 2, it just plugs into your database and it reads the transaction log and starts to stream the, the, the outer table, insert and update, delete statement that happens on the tables, and they propagate that on the message bus, usually they use Kafka, which is an ordered high performance uh, distributed event system. So, and the clients can then consume these events to be creating this architecture. So I want you, I'm almost out of time, but I want you to show a very cool demo of a CDC 
solution, which is Debezium. Debezium uh, is an open source project sponsored by Red Hat, and currently it supports MySQL, Postgre, uh, MongoDB, uh, Oracle, which is not final, but uh, it, it already works, and the next one should be SQL Server. So we're trying to provide CDC support for a lot of different databases. And just in case you already use Oracle, if you ever heard of Golden Gate, it's a kind of, uh, it can be used as CDC too. CDC 2.2, okay? So let me show you a very quick demo. I have here in my machine running, if you get to look the terminal, okay? Here I have a, a, a Zookeeper running because that's a requirement for Kafka. Here I have a Kafka bus for distributing the messages. Oh, another point, Kafka is very interesting for this kind of application because again, it's ordered, so every client uh, uh, receives the messages on the same order, and it's persistent. You don't ever lose a message. And you, here I have a MySQL server running. Here I have a MySQL terminal, just to show you some things. I have a Debezium running on this terminal, and here I have a Debezium watcher, uh, a Kafka watcher, which just show me the message that is passing through the Kafka bus. Right? What do I want to show you here? I have a table. I have a lot of customers, so if you get the ID 1004, is it big enough? Okay. Can increase, then let me try, let's update the ID 1004. It was on, now it's on Mahi. So if I check here, what Division did, we, Division just propagated this message to the console. So I want to see which kind of information I have in Division. So here, uh, the Bizium can propagate me the schema of the table before and after, just, just in case it was an alter table statement. But since it's an updating statement, I have this very nice information, which is before my statement, it was n, and the after statement is n mahi. I have some like internal information here from MySQL, and the operation was an update operation, okay? I'm out of time already, but one of the questions that people issued to me, well, what happens if Debezium uh, stops to, to run and keep, people keep writing on the database? Well, Debezium stores on the Zookeeper, uh, which was the last transaction that it read from the database. So if you stop Debezium and start it over again, it knows where it stopped and it will start to broadcast the messages um, uh, from, the, from the point in time that it has stopped it. So you don't ever lose any kind of transactions, right? So that's what I wanted to show you today. If you want to read more information, we'll be sharing much more information about this subject and many others on the developers.redhat.com website. I would love your feedback. If you have any other different strategy, if it's useful for you, for you please reach out to me. And the best way to talk to me is through my Twitter handle, at Yanaga, or my email, yanaga at redhat.com. And thank you very much. I don't think we I don't think we have time for questions, but maybe uh, the organizers can find a way to distribute the books later. But I have a special request before we finish. Can I take a selfie with you?